for the Warfighter Symposium today. And I'd ask to invite the panel members up to come as I introduce them and get set. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd ask you to stay in place. Following this uh, final panel for the Warfighter Symposium, we will announce the winners of the battle challenge and then turn it over to our president and CEO for closing remarks. So stay tuned, stay in your seats, and stay motivated for our final panel. SMA, panel members. Now I'm actually going to get on the stage. So. so ladies and gentlemen, as they're making their way to the stage, we have Contemporary Military Forum 6, Soldier Readiness. Cohesive teams multiply an organization's ability to fight and win. Soldier readiness is at the forefront of that concept. Our panel members are here to discuss the critical components necessary to organizational success. I'm honored to introduce our distinguished panel for Contemporary Military Forum 6. You just heard from him. Our 16th Sergeant Major of the Army is our moderator and lead for the final panel. Command Sergeant Major J.T. Holland is the 18th Airborne Car Senior Enlisted Representative, and you heard him in the previous panel, and he is overseeing the non-notice deployment of thousands of soldiers to Kuwait, Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, and Washington, D.C., and Eastern Europe. His leadership of the Corps initiatives have helped improve leader engagement and reduce overall harmful behaviors. Command Sergeant Major Michael Weimer. He is the senior enlisted leader of the U.S. Army Special Operations Command. He has more than 26 years of experience as a Special Forces operator, leading at all echelons of Special Forces operations. He is currently overseeing a cultural shift within USASOC toward improving the holistic health of the soft community. And finally, Mr. Evan Van Nostrand is the University of Alabama. Where's the fans at? Roll Tide. Roll Tide. Oh boy. He is the University of Alabama's football team's assistant director of player development for character and career development. Mr. Van Nostrand is a U.S. Marine Corps veteran with multiple deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan. He was also awarded the Purple Heart twice for wounds sustained in combat. SMA Grinston, over to you. Okay, thanks. I, I think I've done all my introductions. Um, I'm really excited to be the moderator on this panel, so I'll get up and we'll, uh, we'll torture the other panel members if, if you haven't had enough of uh, Sergeant Major Holland today. Um, but I'm really excited about why we have this the panel. We're going to talk about cohesive teams that are highly trained, disciplined, and mentally fit, um, and all that stuff and rolled up into how we can you know, really discuss and make a difference from a cohesive team. So I'm really uh, excited to have up here with our panel members and I really look to, to hear uh, all that you have to say. Um, we're gonna rely on Evan since, uh, you know, we'll say because he's a Marine, but uh, he's a great person and uh, thanks for joining us. A special thanks for him. Um, I look forward to that. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Sergeant Major Holland. Thank you, Sergeant Major Army. Uh, Really, when we look at the topic and uh, from the perspective of the 18th Airborne Corps, you know, the, you heard the Sergeant Major of the Army talk about this is my squad, right? Highly trained, disciplined, fit, cohesive teams. That's the foundation of who the 18th Airborne Corps is. That is who we are, right? And we have a document, that foundational document I mentioned last panel, that defines who we are. And that's, that is the bedrock of every squad in the 18th Airborne Corps, right? That's the culture we strive to maintain and that's a culture that we drive at the lowest echelons of our leadership, right? On top of that, uh, what, what makes us lethal and trained to be the most lethal formation in the joint force is that immediate response force, contingency response force requirement, right? Uh, we have to be ready to fight and win tonight, exactly as the SMA described earlier. Everybody thinks the 18 hour sequence, they think about the 82nd Airborne Division. Right, the SMA described from the Soleimani hit all the way to the current crisis in, in the UCOM AOR, uh, what the 82nd has done, what the 18th Airborne Corps has done. Right? That is just talking about the immediate response force. That's four times in the last two years I was a Corps Sergeant Major that we asked that immediate response force to deploy no notice to a different geographic command. Uh, and that's all through the Fort Bragg, North Carolina, power projection platform, right? The, the strategic thing that we do uh, that seems almost as SOP, standing operating procedure, to get a brigade combat team, 18 hours wheels up to go anywhere in the world uh, within that call for, to be a member, that lead element of the joint force. 
right? Whether it's forcible entry, non-combatant evacuation operation, or any, any call to, to, to quell crises. We don't want it just to be the 82nd Airborne Division or the 18th Airborne Corps Headquarters. It's not, right? The Contingency Response Force is more than that. And, and, and part of that whole UCOM AOR, the 3rd Infantry Division, four months removed from coming back from, the, from uh, Korea rotational unit, the 1st Brigade 3rd ID Combat Team, within eight days of notification, will wheels up in UCOM AOR and within 14 days shoot in gunnery, an armor brigade combat team from the 18 Airborne Corps. That is something that is absolutely part of our culture and who we are, right? It's not just an airborne IBCT, it's an armor brigade combat team. It's our JLOT's capability from our 7th Transportation Brigade. It's, it's all those elements within our core ready to go whenever the nation needs us. It's, it's our legacy, right? It's fighting and winning tonight. And that's everything in that, like I said, is built on that bedrock of trust, cohesion, disciplined fit, well-trained teams. Thank you, Thanks, SMA. Evan. First off, I'd like to start by thanking uh, SMA for bringing me out here. Um, for the rest of you all, this is a great privilege for myself. I apologize for being the Marine in the room, but uh, you know, I've moved on from those days. I like to be a little bit more of a regular person. Um, but a lot of the so things- So you're, you're saying Marines are not regular people? Well, you know. <laughs> That's okay. Less is more, less is more. Less is more. <laughs> right. So, you know, the big thing that I keep hearing, and we've all spoken about it, is culture. Um, to us, culture is everything. Um, and when Sergeant Major came down in November, him and I were able to discuss about NCOs, the, the great pride that he takes in development of his NCOs. Um, that's what has helped make me successful with the responsibilities that I have to do with our football players. Because to coach, it's very important that we surround our players with individuals of character. And you all represent the best character our country has to offer. Um, I think like many of you, we're also facing a lot of unknowns right now as the landscape of college football is completely changing. Um, the battlefield is changing for you all as we've pulled out of Iraq, Afghanistan, and there's always gonna be a fight for you all. Um, the big thing for culture you know, is the fact that for us, it's, it's we're not preparing for one game. It's our expectation to, to make it to the national championship, but we're not preparing for that one game. What we're preparing to do is be, be the best version of ourselves day in and day out, and that requires us to be process-oriented. Being process-oriented, I decided that I was gonna hire a whole bunch of, uh, I actually hired a special operations uh, soldier of 20 years and three of our Army ROTC cadets to come work with me this summer because we're doing a uh, performance evaluation system and we're evaluating our, our football player's character. Um, so what did I want to do? I wanted to bring in the best. I wanted to bring in those that have these qualities. And I know that it's a big deal for Sergeant Major that you all have these qualities. Um, and that's ultimately what makes us able to play at our best versus any opponent. It doesn't matter. We don't look at the scoreboard. The scoreboard's gonna take care of itself because we know that we prepare every day, day in and day out, with the same kind of effort, intensity, um, a culture of discipline and accountability, not only to ourselves, but to each other. Um, and, you know, I know that we've all talked about a holistic warfighter. You know, everything from their physical fitness to their mental health to, to their sleep is important to being an Alabama football player to us. Um, and I think as we continue, you'll hear a lot more similarities and we'll be able to discuss more of the things that hopefully I can leave with you all and I can bring back some things from these great war fighters back to our hopefully national championship run this year. I like the way you think. <laughs> so Sergeant Major Warmer. I uh, appreciate it, SMA. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick up right where Evan left off right there at, at Culture, right? We, we, um, we say it a lot, um, we put it on posters, um, but I think we need to take a little bit more time within each one of our organizations down to the lowest level to really define it and understand what, uh, what that means for each, each individual in your organization. My, uh, my experience is I'll, I'll find varying uh, definitions, and that's where some of the confusion comes in. Um, how you define that and measure it is critical, and you have to agree on that, right? It's easy to, uh, it's easy to define, although the SMA probably is gonna chuckle, uh, ACFT standards, 
Um, but, but it is, right? It's very tangible. Um, your, uh, your marksmanship qualifications, your O course time, those are very tangible things uh, that we measure all the time. Um, and we'll use those things to identify readiness, culture, what, you know, harmful behaviors. Um, I really appreciate you mentioning character because, um, again, it's the intangible things within your culture that I think are the, the foundation that make us the most resilient. Equipment's going to fail. You're going to have a bad day. You're going to get injured. But how resilient are you to push through that and still win? Because winning still does matter to us. Um, and bounce back and recover, and your teammate picks up where you potentially can't, uh, can't fill that gap at that point in time. Um, and so I, uh, I know we're spending a lot of time talking about this um, and defining it um, and making sure units, they're all on the same sheet of music. There's nothing worse than going outside the wire and everybody was on a different version of the op order. <laughs> and I think that's what we have, uh, we have going on a little bit in some of our organizations. Um, so I'll stop there and okay. continue the next one. Uh, so, like I said, I'm going to drive the conversation for a few minutes as uh, you think of some really good questions for the panel. Uh, um, I'm actually going to start with Evan and I'll go to the other two uh, panel members. You know, we talked a lot about recruiting for the Army. We talked about sessions, and you mentioned a little bit about some people want to bring in and talk about recruiting a little bit. But how much, uh, you know, does culture and uh, recruiting play a role in bringing in new people um, at the University of Alabama? And then I'll bring it over to the other two also. That's a great que question. Um, you know, just like the Army, you have standards. There's certain individuals' characteristics that you're looking for when you're recruiting. Same thing with our special forces. There's certain requirements. Um, but you create a culture that re that appeals to only a certain group. You know, you only want certain people to join the Army. You don't want everybody that thinks they can do this do it, right? You only want the best of the best to come do this because not everybody can do what you guys are asked to do day in and day out. So we present a culture to them that, look, nothing is going to be given here. There is no entitlement here. You will work for everything. In a generation, especially right now, in a, in a society that is very outcome driven, you know, when am I going to play? Am I going to play as a freshman? How much money am I going to make it now that we can make money off of their name, image, likeness? Those are all outcomes. Those outcomes, if you're outcome oriented, you're going to be let down. So we only want people that are process oriented. So when we paint the picture to these kids as they're coming on recruiting visits, we don't, we don't paint them a rose garden. You know, we tell them how it is. We tell them that you're going to have to work for everything. It's not just about your athletic ability, you know, and I think of what you guys deal with all the time. You can be the, you know, you can be the best shot, but does that mean you're the best soldier? You know, and the same thing for us when we're recruiting, you know, we have the ability to get whatever four star or five star that we want, but we don't just look at their ability. We talk about their, their character. We talk about, are they a good teammate? You know, what, what kind of competitive character are they? Because the way that we see it, and just like you all, we're going to get them for three to five years. There's no, you can't make the mistake of, oh, well, you know, here's year one, and he didn't quite pan out. Well, now we're a scholarship short. So that's why the, even the recruitment is huge. And, you know, we tell, we tell kids all the time, not everybody can play for the Yankees. Well, not everybody can play for Alabama football, and not everybody can be an Army soldier. Yeah, I like that. Sir Major Hall. Thanks, SMA. Uh, great point, Evan. Uh, you know, it's, I kind of look at it, you know, uh, every time someone asks me what I do, you know, how, explain, explain who you are. It's like, and, and, and I kind of introduced kind of what the 18 Airborne Corps and what we do is part of our culture. Like, how would you jump out of a perfectly good, good airplane? And I always think of it like, why would you land in a perfectly good airplane, <laughs> right? Uh, that's the context, uh, you know, we look at it. So we live that legacy every day. That, that's who we are. So every day our actions speak for ourselves. from, uh, when you look at the current crisis that we are, the 18 Airborne Corps headquarters deployed to in UCOM AOR, that's, this is the first time the 18 Airborne Corps, the immediate response force, continuous response force, was called no notice to a crisis in Europe since World War II. 
that was where the 18 Airborne Corps was born, and that is where it has returned in crisis yet again, right? So, soldiers join the Army because they know we have to fight and win our nation's wars, right? You come to the 18 Airborne Corps, you know you're going to be part of that mindset of being ready to fight and win tonight, and we're going to test you, right? Additionally, we also, if you listen to the last panel, we're, we're a core of innovation, right? We appreciate ideas. We, we know there's one trapped in every squad. But the only way we're going to find out, about, find out that idea is out there and it's real and it's relevant and we want to share and we have a solution is we have discipline and we have trust, right? Dignity and respect to, to, to get the idea out of that squad, unlock it and get it to our leaders, right? And that's the courage to do so because of who we are. People want to join those types of organizations, right? But they can only do it if we trust that our audio is matching our visual. And I hope that's what we're doing and we're living that legacy and, 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 and there are it's a war for talent. Winning matters, SMA. Yeah. And we want to win, and we want the best talent in the Army to come join our Corps. Now, uh, you know, retention and culture, you know, you're, you're, I guess you're, you know, recruiting sometimes in the Army and that culture. What about for you? So, so this one, for me, is completely grounded in our culture. So you're going to get two types of people, probably three, actually. You're going to get folks that are intrinsically motiv motivated, Period. They're like, I've wanted to play football at Alabama since I was this big. And you're going to get other folks that are, you know, motivated extrinsically because, well, that's the better scholarship. And then there's the person that's, that starts the intrinsic journey, right? uh, service, complete selfless service. And then the retention piece comes in later on where some of the extrinsic uh, motivators to continue to serve after, you know, uh, uh, initial service. I think we do both fairly well. Uh, but I focus a lot on the intrinsic, and that goes back to the culture. I'm going to entice you to come have an opportunity to serve in our formation because I'm going to explain to you how it's the most phenomenal organization you could possibly serve in, much like you just described for the 18th Airborne Corps. And to do that, the audio, ha the audio and video have to be your spot on, have to be. Because um, if the folks inside the formation don't say this is the best place to absolutely work, then not only are you going to struggle in retention, you're going to struggle with off-the-street recruits, but you're also going to struggle uh, when I'm trying to steal uh, CSM Holland's talent from the 18th Airborne Corps uh, to, to go to one of our assessment courses. Um, and so you'll, you'll see the theme. Your culture will affect every aspect of, uh, of your family life, your warfighting functions. You cannot get away from it. And if your culture is not healthy, um, and you're not tending it every day because you have to tend to it every day. It's going to affect something that has to do with how lethal, how disciplined, and how ready you really are. Yeah, that's a, you know, that's a really big, uh, great point. And I, I want a little caveat, just a little bit here. As you said, uh, imagine that a person inside the organization is talking bad about the organization in your culture. And please don't raise your hand, but how many people have been in that unit where somebody in the unit is talking bad about the unit? That, you know, that doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so I really appreciate your, your comments. Imagine what that culture is if that person says, I don't want to be here. And it's a leader. Um, so that's a, that's a huge point you brought up. Um, and we've all seen that, so thanks. Um, shifting uh, topics just a little bit. We talked about readiness and culture. Um, but how, you know, how do we think we can measure those two things? How do we measure a culture? I think we can measure readiness. I think that's pretty clear. I think we have a meeting for that. But, um, you know, how do you do that? How do you measure culture? What does that look like? What's the outcome? I, I'll kind of start. We're going to reverse. We, we're in the middle. Then we're going to, so, uh, Sergeant Major Weimer, what do you think? How do you measure culture? So, again, back to something that's very squishy. Um, very uh, not you know tangible. Um, I'll tell you, this is where we're spending a lot of time. Uh, SMA's heard it, and CSM Holland, we're we're putting a uh, human factors dashboard together to 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 collect all data, not just the ACFT data, but where are we at with harmful behaviors? Where are we with uh, what are we doing with our with our command climate surveys after we after we take them every mandatory period of time? Where is that data going? the assessment of it just stops. And so we have all of this data out there that I think we're not, uh, we're not well, I know, we're not fully seeing ourselves. Uh, and if you can't fully see yourself, 
think of a formation. Mine's small, actually, 36,000. You look at Command Sergeant Major Holland and just shy of 100,000. I look down at CSM Sims, and it's enormous um, at Forcecom. Um, if you can't see yourself at each one of the echelons you move up with it, as an organizational leader, it just gets worse and worse. And so we're attempting to use data, uh, but we're also attempting to, to create the visual display so that data is usable. It's, uh, uh, it's not overwhelming. Uh, I'm not a ones and zeros person, but I know the value of the ones and zeros and then being able to overlay them. Uh, a thousand data streams overlaid into a holistic picture uh, is incredibly powerful. Vice, uh, monthly single data stream reports that I don't actually, I'm not able to do some comparative analysis with. So that, that includes where are we with domestic violence, sexual harassment, sexual assault, suicide, suicide ideations. Uh, where are my true readiness levels, the ones that I can record? Where, where's my command climate survey? Where, when I talk to people, what are my retention numbers? Is recruiting down? Why don't people want to come to my organization? That's an indicator something's going on. Uh, a matter of fact, it matters to me a lot because I'm, I'm very selfish with our, our organization and culture, and I think it's pretty doggone awesome. Um, and when I find out uh, uh, data starting to show me others don't think that, it's time for me as a leader to get intrusive, uh, which is really a big part of what engaged leadership means. Okay. I think we're going to start with your Holland. How do you, you know, again, the question, how do you measure culture uh, in your organization? Thanks for the question, SMA. In, in, in summary, Dwyer, I brought up some really good points. You know, objectively, it's easy, as you mentioned, with the unit status re re report, when we talk here, readiness. And in the context of an infantry rifle squad, it's like six of nine soldiers assigned, weapons, qualifications, went to a live fire in the last year. That's great, they're ready, but are they lethal? Are they cohesive? Do they have a good culture? That's subjective, right? So how do we measure those intangibles that say uh, that, they're, that they have a good culture Right? And, and they treat each other with dignity and respect. Uh, we use a lot of data to do that. We also use competitions. Like I just announced the, the 18 Airborne Corps Best Squad com competition winner right before this panel. The 101st Airborne Division Air Assault won the 18 Airborne Corps represents the Forces Command competition next month. Fantastic competition. Right? That showed how ready they were and how lethal they were. More importantly, it showed me how that culture within that battalion, that brigade, and that division impacted the cohesiveness of that squad, right? That's delivering that lethality. That leader was able to win at the point of contact with his squad uh, because of the culture that was in that formation, right? That trust, able to do what they were able to do over the last four days to win that competition. Uh, subjectively, we are using data, what Sergeant Major Weimer brought up, right? When we look at something that uh, uh, we're working with the Department of Army G9 and a little bit with General Nori on uh, on some other uh, project with the uh, holistic health and fitness application that you were able to go down and see Falcon H2F facility yesterday, SMA, is that's great. We talk about those professionals, but how do we make sure we get the professionals to the paratrooper, to the soldier, at not just the point of need, but before, uh, before that point of need, right? So we do micro assessments, whether it's through lethality, whether it's through uh, marksmanship, whether it's through cognitive behavioral, behavior assessment, spirituality. We bring all that information together on one dashboard and we got an algorithm that measures that out and says, hey, wh what is that score? What is that best version of you? And then on the top end, we have our H2F professionals and our leaders are able to see the scores and on the other side of it and say, hey, why is this soldier changing this workout? Why is this soldier changing this weight? Oh, we find out when we get the, the, the H2F professional in there, they're actually, they're gonna cause an injury. We're gonna stop what they're doing now. We're gonna rehabilitate them. We want to keep them in the fight, right? That's a culture of readiness, right? That's, a, that's showing the soldier, hey, uh, we bu you bought into who we are, and we're going to put the resources and time and space to help you be the best version of yourself. That's an organization I want to be a part of. That's an organization they want to be a part of. Leaders that take care of me, leaders that win at the point of contact, and in, place, in this case is using data to help our soldiers f be there when the time matters most, to fight and win when we need them. Yeah. And, and Evan, you talked about, you know, we're looking at this character and you did talk about culture too. So 
you know, what does that look like? How do you measure it? So actually, it's funny. Uh, both CSMs have talked about things that we're actually putting into play this summer, and that's why I hired uh, some ROTC cadets and a, veteran, a couple of veteran soldiers. Um, we started a, our own performance evaluation management system that's based off of, I think we had a consultant come in a couple of years ago. But when I saw him do it, I was like, we can do this better, and we can actually use this for our subjective evaluations, and it can back it up. So we, we are tracking everything that is an outcome oriented for our guys. I don't care how fast they go. I don't care how much they're lifting. I don't care about what their weight is. What I care about is, are you a good teammate? What is your body language when you come into workouts? Are you interacting with your teammates? Are you bending over when you're, when you're blowed? You know, all these things to us is what matters, and it's all based off of, you know, you talk, CSM Holland talks about who we are. We have our own document of players to win and coaches to win, and everything that we have, are evaluating our guys off of is what those intangibles are that our head coach says, this is what makes successful football players, and this is what makes successful teams. Um, so the, the cool thing that we've been able to evaluate with all of this is we've also been able to take care of our guys a lot better because if a guy's baseline score is around 200 every week and then all of a sudden he's at a 50 one week, you know, we would, as coaches, it was easy for us to be like, hey man, why are you missing class right now? What's wrong with you? Are you lazy? You, you know, this, that, coming at them. But now we can look at all of it holistically and say, okay, here's one of my high performers and all of a sudden he's got a 50 because at the end of the day, your troops, my football players, it matters when you can see this stuff without them having to tell you, because they're not always gonna tell you. So the ability to do that shows that how much you care about them, and then we get, we're able to get these guys back in the fight within a week. Whereas in the past, we only saw the academic score or their nutrition score separately. So then, you know, if one was off or the other one was off, we would just take it as, oh, you're lazy, you're not doing the things that we're asking you to do. But now we're able to look at it and be like, okay, something's going on at home or something's going on with school. Let's, let's take a step back and let's counsel this player. Let's not come at them and let's not yell at them. Look, I used to love to ask you every day when I was in the Marines, all right? <laughs> but it's different now. This generation is different. How you approach them is completely different. Um, I think as leaders, it's important to understand that. I, I've been on calls with Fortune 100 companies around the country, the Marine Corps Leadership Institute, these fine warriors, and then the, you know, the war fighters that I, I employed so that I could ask them their advice. Um, but it all comes down to this. We have to be able to adapt to this generation. We have to be able to adapt how they communicate and how to get the most out of them. So to me, I think using, because society is so outcome oriented, being able to use tangible numbers, you know, because they are visual learners, you can use that as leaders to get them to do the things that you need them to do. Yeah, that's a good point. So uh, I'm gonna drive one more question here and then I'm gonna go to the, my other cards over here. So everyone, everybody wants to be part of the best team. Um, and in October, we're going to we're going to name the best squad competition. How much of uh, how much of that is talent, um, and how much is culture? So I think I'm I'm going to write back uh, to Evan. So um, you know when you when you go back and you win something, how much is talent and how much is culture? I think uh, you know I've been very blessed to be with this team for six years. And I've been in winning teams, I've been on losing teams, I've been on teams that I absolutely love to be around, and then I've been on teams where, you know, some of those kids make it a little bit difficult sometimes, but, you know, it is what it is. I still love what I do every day. Um, but I will say this, that we've always believed that when the culture is led by the players, we've always had more success because that means that they own what they're doing everything every day. That means that they have a culture of ownership, of accountability of what their outcome is going to be. Um, so we try and drive it through our players as much as possible. We try and drive the culture through them because at the end of the day, just like these gentlemen, they can tell you to their blue in the face what they want the culture to be, but at, 
the ones executing the culture are the ones that are down, down below. Um, and it's, it's very small instances that make a championship winning team and a non-championship winning team. One of the big things that we really harped on this, this off season, and as simple as this sounds, but tucking your shirt in, taking your bracelets off. Because last year, right, we were, runner up, we were runners up and nobody likes to be the first loser, right? So, but I noticed things. I look for everything that all of our coaches aren't looking for because I never played a day of football in my life. So I have no value to <laughs> any of the coaches when it comes to football. But what I'm looking at is the, the character makeup of our team. What is our culture? It's what I based all my teams off of in the Marine Corps, is what is the culture? You can, you can teach the hard skills to people, but culture is based off of the character of the, the individuals that you're, you're, you're molding. And ultimately, that's what makes successful teams, is the culture of, of individuals that are bought into the process, that are bought into whatever the standards are for your organization. Okay, uh, anything to add? Absolutely. I, I, I think uh, where, where we, um, we, because of our changeover, we're in the middle of PCS season right now. I think this is one of those uh, scenarios where we, we have a tendency to make 10 steps forward and then like five steps backwards. And that's why we spend and emphasize onboarding. Onboarding new people into the culture that Evan was just talking about. The first 100 days is what you'll hear us throw around. That first 100 days is it's everything. It's sink or swim. And so if I'm a new person into, into, our, into our organization, uh, you have 100 days to, to sell me that this culture is awesome and for me to buy into that culture. If not, I just, was in, I just uh, came into your formation and now I am moving and doing things counter to your culture. And we've already discussed how critical the culture is. And so I think it's twofold for the leader. One, you're responsible for that onboarding. And you have to be part of that, because if you're not living that culture, every time you compromise on it, you're, you're, you're killing your own organization. But the second part of that is, as a leader, I feel responsible to identify people that are counter to the culture we're talking about. As a leader, it is incredibly uh, important. Now, that's a move to contact, right? Um, so now you're in, about to be an engaged leader, which means I'm about to be intrusive and find out what's going on with that service member or find out if that service member, to your other point earlier, still needs to be in the service uh, because anything counter your culture that is unhealthy, that is cancer, that, that, that has to get eradicated um, or it will affect your whole culture. You'll have many paracultures within your organization and it absolutely will affect your readiness. Yeah, um, I think I'm gonna follow up a little bit on that. So what happens if you know, we have a bad culture and it's something that may not what we need um, and somebody's joining that, what, how do we get rid of that? Uh, some, somebody new comes in or somebody, yeah. or it, do, it doesn't matter if it's a new person or it's not a new person. Um, if it's a new person, then you approach them like you would any, any new individual in your organization and make sure that they understand, back to why onboarding is so important. Um, if, if I know what the standards are within my organization, I know what PT standards are. I know what ACFT standards are now. I know what marksmanship, I know the expert, we know that stuff. But how, what's the standard in your organization on how you treat other people in your organization. You have to define that. Um, when, you, when you see that, that's, that's why I call it movement to contact. I gotta engage, and that has to happen all the way down to the lowest level. Squad leader is the one that we refer to the most. If you're waiting on your battalion or your brigade CSM to engage, it's never gonna happen because they can't be down at all those levels, which is why the culture, to your point, which I really appreciate, it's tended by the players themselves, which means if I'm Specialist Weimer and that's Specialist Holland down there, we're responsible and we need to know what our culture is. Now, if you're a senior leader and you're, you're not, um, your behavior is counter to your culture, then that's a different discussion. Um, that's, uh, that, that's a little less uh, graceful because I expect more out of you. Uh, and then if you can't course correct, because we have bad days, none of us are perfect, uh, then, then that's a different discussion on whether or not uh, you still want to serve. Okay. And then how does that transition, you know, talent versus culture? And he talked about, you know, 
you know, receiving people. How does that mean? How does that work? 18 different people. But well, SME, I think uh, what was great, both Evan and uh, Summer Wammer brought up is in, in your in your portion, you talk about five star athletes, right? They're the most talented, but they may not make the best teammate, right? And you've seen that, right? So it's a recruiting person. It's got to figure out who they are, what makes them tick. For Sergeant Major Weimer, uh, the, mo the most physically gifted, talented uh, soldier in the Army may not make the best operator on that small team, right? Uh, and in the 18th Airborne Corps, uh, we have a lot of talented people, but it's got to be the culture, right? It's no innocent bystander, SMA, right? That's holding people accountable. That's giving people a voice. Um, it starts at a reception companies. Right? We got to put talented people in our reception companies because that's the first person that a soldier and a family sees when they show up at Fort Bragg, Fort Campbell, Fort Drum, Fort Stewart, Fort Polk, wherever you show up at our camps, posts, and stations. Uh, that reception company should embody who you are as a command team. Right? That, that's your first impression, and we all know you don't get a second one. Uh, so we got to put our people there, and, and they start the enculturation process. And then it transition. How, how do you do your integration for that new soldier and family? Right? The integration process has to baseline the standards of discipline and the culture of your organization. So you understand what right looks like, right? We got a new, a new person who decides to raise the right hand and join the Army, right? They come to initial entry training. They start kind of shaping up. They build some physical capability. They start understanding what a soldier somewhat looks like. And then they go to AIT, right? Advanced Individual Training. Now they're learning how to be a, 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 a soldier with their craft. And then they show up to Fort Bragg, right? And at Fort Bragg, and, and when they do the reception company integration process, whether it's airborne integration course or the modern integration course or, or your mountain tough in Fort Drum, right, we're showing them who it is to be that soldier on installation. What we don't want is that young soldier that shows up on day one in the reception company, stand at parade, rest to, their, to Sergeant Holland, and, and they absolutely get in treatment of dignity and respect. And then you go four months later and you all seen it. Now they fell in with the barracks lawyers, right? And they're like, hey, how's it going? It's like, Sergeant? What happened to that soldier at Stand and Pray Rest? That's culture, right? That is culture, right? That enculturation process that I want that soldier not just to be a good soldier, but better a soldier for life. When they come, when it's time to lead the Army and they do something greater and they want to, maybe they want to join the Alabama football team or whatever, all right, we're all responsible for that soldier's lifelong learning and development process, whether while they're wearing a uniform and when they leave and they become a good citizen. So I think, I, I truly believe that's some of our responsibility at the 18th Airborne Corps SMA. Okay. Uh, I really appreciate that. I, um, I think that's one of those things, I think, for the conventional force that we'd ask all of us to learn better um, is how we receive people in our organizations. Um, when I look at green platoons and special operations, those are the absolute best they have to receive people. We put our absolute best drill sergeants to receive soldiers in the Army, and then we get to our unit, and sometimes... Um, we haven't put our absolute best to receive them at our camp post stations, and we can't figure out why the soldiers are bad all of a sudden. So I really appreciate your efforts in doing that, and I think it's one thing as an Army we all have to do better is when a soldier comes to your camp post station, the first person they meet, are they your absolute best person? When they get off that plane at SeaTac going to First Corps, America's First Corps, who are they going to receive at the reception company? Are those barracks good? Uh, do we have the right people? So I really appreciate. Thank you for your efforts there. Okay, now we got some uh, really good questions and cards. Okay, and the first question. Yep, it's uh, pick on Evan time. So <laughs> no, it's not. So first question is for you, Evan. Um, you know, we've seen a change in our society uh, on interactions. Uh, you know, we have for soldiers. But how does this? Have you seen? You kind of touched on this, but have you seen a lot of changes in the soldiers? or the, I'm sorry, the players coming in, you talked about that interaction. Um, you know, how do you interact a little bit differently? Can you expound on that? And have you seen that big change of those that are uh, joining, um, you know, the Alabama football team? Absolutely. Um, this generation is definitely uh, different. They want to know the why to everything that they do. They're not just going to do it, which is fine, because you know what, some of us probably ran through some walls that we probably should have ran through, but we did it because we were told to run through the wall. You know? But that doesn't take away from their want to. Their want to still contribute to society. Now, it's gonna look differently than what it looks like to us. Um, and this is what I talked with Coach back in February. I said, you know, they still wanna play football. They still wanna win. It just looks different. 
So one thing that we found that has worked really well with them is basic fundamentals. You know, everybody's so technologically advanced now and everybody's all about you know, using these cell phones and electronics and computers and everything else. I went back to the basics. We went back to the basics. We went back to building the relationships with the kids as soon as they get there. We started building relationships not just on the field but off the field. Um, that's important because they want to know that they can trust you first before they're going to do what you tell them to do. Um, that's why it's also imperative that whatever information that you are pushing across, you better make sure it's valid. Because if for one instance, they think that you're making something up, they can just go on their phone and look it up and be like, well, you know, this, this article says that you're wrong. And you're just like, well, I don't really know what to do with that one. But, you know, so that's why it's imperative that, you know, if you guys bring in speakers, for instance, like we bring in speakers, make sure that it matches whatever your core values are. Make sure that it's also on the same message that you want it to be presented. Make sure it is valid because the younger generations today are smarter than we are probably, honestly, if we're going to be real about it. They're, they're very in tune to what's going on sociologically. But they don't have basic skills of being able to communicate. You know, that's uh, one thing I've noticed that at first, when we first get some of them, it's very difficult to start with them. But you start small. Where are you from? You got brothers, you got sisters. You know, tell me about your family. What do you like to do for fun? I know it sounds real simple, but I noticed for a while that we were just so focused on making ball players and developing them into football players that we were forgetting about the people portion. Well, today, people care about the people portion. Um, like I said earlier, we're talking to Fortune 100 companies, we're talking to different entities. You know, everybody's doing a paradigm shift towards character. Everybody's doing a paradigm shift towards basic fundamentals of getting to know each other again. You know, if you look at COVID, some people were locked up for two years. You don't use your social skills, you lose them. So that's one thing that we've tried to also work back on is getting our guys back into the normal routine. COVID's in the rearview mirror. Now it's about going back to business the way that we're supposed to do business. But you have to start from square one. We act like they don't know anything. We act like they don't know how to walk into the room and, and shake a hand and, and start a conversation with people. Um, it's not to insult them, but if they don't know and then you get upset with them because they don't know, then they're going to get frustrated because it's not their fault that they don't know. Um, I think you'll probably deal with the same thing with your soldiers. It's not just about doing the mission, but they want to know why they're doing the mission. Um, but it's interesting. It's definitely a, a changing landscape when you're used to just doing what you're told, when you're told, how you're told. Um, but it's been fun because it challenges me as a leader, and I've always told my fellow leaders, I said, look, at the end of the day, it doesn't give you an excuse not to lead. That's ultimately the, the biggest thing I want you to take away from it. Leaders are gonna lead no matter what. Just like you, know, you guys talk about this competition. Uh, we competed with our evaluation system too, where we added up all their points. Having a, a culture and environment of that as well is important. Um, it's important for the communication aspect, getting working, working as teams, um, putting them in situations where they're not comfortable communicating with each other. It's, it's important. It's, uh, there's a difference between coaching and counseling. You know, coaching is, hey, you go do this exactly like this. Counseling is more of, hey, why do we do it like this? Go more with the Socratic method of teaching. Ask them, why did you come to that, that conclusion? Or when a guy is missing class on a regular basis, what's going on? What can we do to fix this? Put the ball in their court so that they have to take ownership of what they're about to say out of their mouth. Um, but that's all I really got for that one. Thank Smart you. Majors. And uh, for the record, I did not pay Evan to say 90% of what he just said. So um, I think I've said a thousand times to ask people where they're from, just sit down and say, where are you from? How'd you grow up? So um, I really appreciate your thoughts and you know, especially you see you said today, you know, it's about taking care of people. And I'm sure the chief of staff of the Army who said people first. Um, and it's good to hear it resonates all the way down. So I really appreciate that. Okay.
Next question. Oh, I should skip that one too. He says SMA. Uh, okay, I won't. Uh, okay, there are many talk about highly trained, fit, disciplined um, at the intellectual capacity of today's soldier. Um, what quality uh, has changed since Rogers Rangers and the quality that you want our soldiers to never lose with time and technology? Um, uh, I think Evan just talked about a little bit about that is the basic fundamentals of being a, a human. That would be number one, is just how do you interact with people. But I think we've lost the art um, you know, when I look back at Rogers Rangers, the, the art of leadership. So we've got all this technology, um, you know, we, we can look at, well, that's probably a bad example, so um, it was from yesterday, but I won't use that. But there's uh, plenty of examples where when I say, okay, I've got, we've got this great technology, but it failed, what action did you take? What do you mean? Well, Sergeant Major. I said, what did you do about it? Well, we saw it. We admired the problem. We get this all the time. So all this technology is enhancing us. But the technology, a lot of times, there's a human at the end, and we're not fixing the problem. We're, we see it. We can identify it with the data, the technology. But when, what do you do about it? And I think that's where I think what I'd like to bring back is stop admiring the problem. And I think that was, to me, that's resonated for years. And I, I see it more. We have all this information and technology and good old-fashioned just, hey, don't do that. You know, your, your award wasn't turned in on time. So the technology says, I can see all the awards in the Army. I can pull it all up. And you go, yep, didn't get the award. So, yeah, you saw it. But what did you do about it? Did you go to the next level? Well, you know, it's at the division. Well, did you walk over there, first sergeant? But that's division. I can't go to division. Yeah, but you're willing in technology to post it on the internet that I retired and didn't get my award. But you're not willing to just walk over there and say, you know, I'm going, you know, I, I probably would tell. You might want to tell, you know, to the Brigade Sergeant Major, I'm going to see Sergeant Major Pitt. He's like, why? Because the award's that division, and I want the award. So that's the skill, I think, um, that maybe that we, we had highly trained, disciplined, and fit back then. We had it now. But I think that's a little bit of a secret sauce. It goes back to what you said, communicating and all these things, Evan. Is that I think at all echelons, we've lost that skill. Um, so hopefully that answers your questions. If not... Sorry. Okay. Um, okay. Next question. What can what can we do better uh, to prepare our senior NCOs um, to choose those NCO? It says NCOs gaps uh, for their official counterparts. Hmm. Uh, I think I'll I'll kind of think I understand is uh, what can we do better for our um, uh, I think, or to try to close the gap. I think, um, I'll paraphrase this a little bit. Do we need to close the gap between our NCOs and our officers? Oh, remember, is my question, I rephrased it. Go ahead. So, and uh, we will not open this up to the panel. Sergeant Major Weimer. <laughs> I think the gap's been closed um, significantly. <laughs> Uh, I mean, just to just to be, I mean, I, you know, I'm an army brat. This is this is all I know. I'm 50 years old, and my father was in for 27 years, and my grandfather was in for 37, and minus three years at Ohio State. Um, <coughs> but even there, I was doing a little bit of junior, a little bit of ROTC. I think the gap is, it's not the Grand Canyon anymore. I mean, it is it is unbelievable. It kind of goes back to the the question that Evan just had: the, the generations, right? The the talent. In this generation right now, um, and and what we're seeing in our soft coming in to the army off the street in our X-ray programs, I can't find anybody without a four-year degree. I mean, the, the the gap is tremendous. My my bigger concern is 
the, 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 four, the, the education is, it's uh, uh, four year degrees become like high school education now. Um, and so we're, we're trying to figure out now how to um, support master's programs and, and where do you fit that in uh, non-commissioned officer timelines, right? Because we don't have career paths uh, with, uh, you know, programmed in, uh, you know, take a knee, drink water, uh, go, to, go to this course for a year. And that, that was for you down there, CSM. Um, but uh, but I, I, I start off and finish with, I think the gap is much smaller than it, than it used to be. Okay. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, I w I'll kind of, I'll put a little thing in there because a lot of times I get this question like, okay, so are we going to pay enlisted for degrees? Um, and this came up maybe not in this last week for me. And I'm going to tell you no. You know, and we're like, Sergeant Major, well, I have a degree and my officer has, I have more education, which we found that. I have more education than my officer counterpart. I said, okay. Uh, you know, I know, you know, I'm not trying to be hateful. Um, well, yeah, I mean, you got a program, go to OCS, do those other things. What I'm saying is um, we have a highly educated, you know, NCO Corps, um, and we have distinct roles and responsibilities of our officers. We have the greatest officer corps in the world. Um, and there are two distinct things we have in our army and they're going to be that way uh, and, and I don't want to you know overlook the education piece but there's a thing we need and we need really the chief talked about it, we need people that can go and fight the nation's wars and sometimes people have degrees and sometimes they don't um, so and there's a lot of people that have been asked for 20 years and did that over and over and over again and I, I, I know one specifically, and I, I tell people all the time, he's got a PhD in war fighting, but he doesn't have a degree. Um, so I, I think, the, I agree, the gap's closed, but I wanna be very cautious. Number one, um, you know, there's, there's different rules and laws that govern our officer corps uh, that don't govern uh, the enlisted, and we, we need to keep it that way for all the right reasons. So we appreciate the degrees, but that is not the end all do all for the enlisted. And I'm very cautious. Now, this says the person I'm very proud of uh, receive my degree in the Army. Um, but uh, I'm very cautious when people go, well, I, I have this degree and I'm enlisted and I, therefore I should get paid more. Well, your degree's in teaching, but you're, that's not the skill we're asking you to do in the Army. Okay. That's usually those hand in hand questions. So I wanted to expand on that. Okay, next question. Okay, and this is right up uh, the street. We're going with Sergeant Major Helen as we read. Okay, many supporting organizations uh, from local government, state government, and nonprofit sector attend this warfighter symposium seeking to integrate the Army needs, uh, what the Army needs in support and resiliency programs for soldiers and families. Sergeant Major. Please share the best practices and emerging needs that would help allow these organizations to better support the Army. Sergeant Major Hall, you're it. Excellent question, SMA. Um, I saved the hard one just for you. <laughs> well, I would tell you we're, we're, we're working on a creating an environment for just, just that right now. Um, if, you, if you were in here listening to the previous panel, we talk, uh, you heard me talk about the, uh, the innovation outpost, right? We're trying to create an environment where uh, People with industry uh, can collaborate and work with our soldiers, our DA civilians, right? Whether it's the 18 Airborne Corps, whether it's AMC, MCOM, uh, whether it's USASOC or anybody else that's uh, that's living on an 18 Airborne Corps Force Com installation. Uh, competition is important to us, right? We're not wedded to one widget, uh, one piece of innovation, one algorithm. Uh, we want the best things out there that's available that can help the quality of life for our soldiers and families. So I say, if you're, if you're out there and, and, you, and you're in technology or if you're anything that improves quality of life or anything that the, uh, the Army or the Joint Force is interested in, uh, the, the door is open. But what I would tell you is I'll also elaborate uh, off the last panel is don't, don't come with uh, the jargon. Come with the proof that it works because we're going to test it. And just like what General Cogbill mentioned earlier, paratroopers break things. Yeah. They're meant to break things. <laughs> we're going to give it to a group of angry little group of paratroopers, and they're going to try to break what you're, sh what you're trying to sell us, right? 
and, and we're going to give you feedback, and that's what it's about. That's why we have an Army Futures Command, and that's why the 18th Airborne Corps, and, and you suck too as a fast follower in everything they're doing, right? So I invite you to partner with us and, and offer those things, and we'll be happy to, to, to try them out. As a matter of fact, I'm looking And right break at, things. And, and break things. I'm looking right at our Data Warfare Company Commander, <laughs> and she's, she's all on board, SMA, so. The Data Warfare. Hopefully you're not breaking things in data. Um, okay. Um, we got a couple more questions. So just trying to pick a really good. Um, we talk about resiliency. Can you uh, comment, maybe even for you, Evan, about resiliency? We talk about this. I'd you know, we'd really like to get your perspective. Can you comment on how the dimensions of strength, spiritual, family, social, emotional, physical, are used in building and sustaining resiliency? I don't know if you talk about that in uh, in your I'd field, be, um, and then I'll maybe even open it up to Sergeant John. I'd be glad to talk about that. Um, one thing that I've always been very impressed with our program is the amount of resources that we have available for our guys. Uh, we have three clinical psychologists that are on staff for our guys, and it, we have a director of behavioral medicine. She has a PhD in behavioral medicine, um, so she deals with their sleep, she deals with substance abuse, all that, all the behavioral issues that come with it. Um, but then we also look at the, we have religious counselors, we have all this recovery for training, you know, we have a cryo, cryotherapy thing in the, in the training room. But we, we take a holistic approach that it's not just about um, your ball skills. And doing that creates a healthy mindset, you know, and what we really try to do is we mentally condition our guys, and mental condition is the ability to identify and edit behaviors that are conducive to individual success that ultimately lead to the team's success. So in layman's terms, we like to say, can you handle what's inside of your box? And inside of your box is everything from your own mental health, your financial planning. Um, we, do, we do tax classes with our guys. But we, we talk about all the different things and we try and get them into routines. Routines is the biggest thing in combating some of our um, guys that may go through some slumps, you know, because everybody goes up through ups and downs. But getting them into routines is what we really try and do with them and be able to identify the things that are conducive to success. So is vaping, is that really a smart thing? You know, is, is drinking all the time or is, you know, is cannabis use going to help help your performance? You know, so those are things that we address with all of our guys, and we make sure that we bring in experts for that. And if we don't have residential experts, then we bring them in, we bring them in to to speak with them. Like I said, I had no problem reaching out to the Army, the Department of Defense, because I I looked at it as chances are whatever we're dealing with, because it's a team atmosphere, you're probably dealing with, and you probably already spent a lot more money on on the research of it. Um, but I, I like to say that I took a lot of what we do with, with our guys from what I did in the military, from what you all do for your soldiers, making sure during their pre-deployment workup that you're going to see you know, spiritual counselors and that you have you know, your Title IX meetings and that you have your domestic violence meetings and all that stuff. That stuff matters. That stuff makes a difference because even if it doesn't look like they're paying attention, that seed gets planted. That seed will grow, and it'll be used when you don't, when you least expect it to be used. You, when, a, when one of our players is going to our Title IX coordinator because they had an incident with at the dorms, but because we do all this stuff, we try and give them the skills, we try and give them the behaviors that are gonna be conducive to them being successful, and not just on the ball field. You know, we like to tell our guys that football is going to end one day, and we're developing them not for success in the NFL, it's about being successful in general, being successful people that give back to society. We want them to all get their degree. You know, so by being the leaders and encouraging positive behaviors is the best way to, to, to tackle that, I believe. Okay. Um, well, we got, uh, looks like uh, time for one more question. Um, so I wish I'd get them to them all, but uh, time is limited. So uh, I think I've got a few more seconds. I'll address one more, and I apologize we didn't get to all the card questions. Very question. Um, it says uh, for me. It says, can you speak about you know 
the soldier prep course um, that the chief of staff of the army talked about. You know, part says, what's that about? So uh, do, and really I like that. I like that it says, uh, do you think that will make a difference um, in recruiting quality? Um, I'm not sure it'll make a difference in uh, recruiting quality, um, but my perspective is um, if you've got the will, you know, and the, and the aptitude to join the military, I can get you to the Army standard. You know, it kind of talks about that culture and character. Um, if you don't have the culture and the character, then it's going to be hard. And you don't have the will, it's, you know, it's going to be, you know, it's impossible to get you to an Army standard. So am I a firm believer in the prep course? Absolutely am. If, if those individuals, you know, have the character and they're willing to do the culture and they have the will, but they're just a little bit outside on um, the standards and we can work with them, I can get you there. But if you have no will, <laughs> then we'll never get you. So, uh, so do I believe in the prep course? Uh, I think it's a good thing. I think it's the right thing. Um, they've lost some of the skills. I mean, you, see, you, you just heard Evan talk about some of that. They've lost some of those skills that uh, we all had. Uh, we used to be out there, and I always talk about how I grew up in, in Alabama. You just kind of, it's like, go outside, you know? And it's, it's almost the exact opposite. You know, nobody told us to go outside. You know what we had? We had things to tell us to come inside. It's like, you better be home when you hear this bell. What do you mean? It's getting dark, or, I mean, at some point, somebody literally had put a church bell outside their house and they would just bang it as hard as they could. That's how far away we would be that we just wouldn't be in. And it's the exact opposite now. It's like, no, get out. I'm playing this game. I'm doing this. I don't want to leave. No, get out of the house. No, I can't leave. Never. You, you even see the commercial, right? Never leave home. Never leave home. <laughs> so um, if you have the will... Uh, and you want to join our army and you've got that character, I'm a firm believer in the prep course. Uh, you're just a little bit outside the standards. We'll get you to the standard um, and we'll get you to join the army. So um, I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you for your questions. Thank you for um, sticking in there, the last forum and the last panel. And for the panel members, um, I've worked with these gentlemen, the two on you know, the far right and the left. Uh, these are great warriors, and I'm proud to be on the stage with them. And Evan, thank you. I uh, recently met him and your insights, and it's fascinating to hear how much commonalities we have in recruiting culture and those cohesive teams, and I really appreciate that. And uh, could you please give us a round of applause? Thanks, buddy. I'm going to have to get you down well, thank you, panel members. Over 100 years of military experience, and what a phenomenal experience to have Aaron here with us today. To, I'm, Evan, I'm sorry. Evan here with us today to talk about the experiences of Alabama football. One more uh, call out for the Alabama football fans in the crowd. It's roll Tide. There you go. There, there's about four of them here. That's great. Four. Uh, four. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, panel members, and thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, Dan. To allow us to AUSA to host you here today. All right, ladies and gentlemen, as we get transitioned to our final event before General Brown gives closing remarks to the phenomenal first inaugural Warfighter Symposium, I want to give you a special gift. General Haley, before I came up here, said, Sergeant Major, I'm going to do a one-time special gift for all the people who stuck it out to the end, the people with grit, resiliency, and were willing to stay here to the end. All of you in the room right now who have stayed here to the final events are going to get a free basic membership to AUSA. And all you, have, yeah. all you have to do is go to booth 300 and see lovely Christine or Angela. They will get you signed up, and you will reap the benefits of being a member of the finest institution the Army ever produced, and you will feel like a professional for the rest of your life. At this time, I'd like to introduce uh, both our Vice President for Meetings and Membership, General Jack Haley, and our president, General Robert Brown, to the stage, because we're going to give out a special gift. 
And if I could also please have the Sergeant Major of the Army come up and help us with this presentation. As all of you are aware, I'm sure, all of you new members of AUSA are aware, we have been running a battle challenge um, next door, part of the inaugural Warfighter Symposium to recognize the proficiency of our soldiers as they demonstrate some of the replicated wartime tasks during that obstacle course. Who in the uh, room uh, participated in the battle challenge? Please raise your hand. All right, we got some people down there. All right, yeah. Okay, yeah. I want to thank our sponsor for our battle challenge, GEICO. Without them, we could not have made this possible, as well as all the other vendors that were here this week. Thank you for your tremendous uh, contribution to the Association of the United States Army. So now it's time. General Brown, with your permission, may I open the magic, well, jacket pocket, I guess. I don't have an, I don't have an envelope. We, we weren't that prepared. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies first is what I was taught as a young man, so we'll start with the top female time. But a little bit about her. She was a West Point graduate of 2019. She was an athlete on the women's lacrosse team. Her name is First Lieutenant Hannah Shiflett. <laughs> she had the best time for the females in the battle challenge of three minutes, 3.68 seconds. Let's give her one more big round of applause. And she is being handed the AUSA Epic Award for her outstanding achievements. She'll also be given a gift package donated by our sponsor, Geico, full of wonderful gifts. And for our male competitor category, this gentleman was also a West Point graduate from 2009. He was an athlete, four-year varsity football player. Let's hear a Go Army beat. Here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Major Dominic Sinodo. Major Sinodo's time was one minute and 40.07 seconds. Outstanding achievement. He's also been given the Epic Award by General Brown and will also receive the same package of wonderful gifts. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give our finishers, top finishers for both male and female categories, another big round of applause. <laughs> and again, thanks to our sponsors of GEICO and all of our vendors that participated in the symposium today. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce the President and Chief Executive Officer of the United States Association of the United States Army, General Retired Robert Brown. Thanks, Sergeant Major. Hey, uh, I'm sure you want about an, an hour speech at the end. Seems appropriate. Uh, no, just a real quick thanks for coming. Tremendous panels. Great to be here in North Carolina. I think the feedback is uh, back next year. This is the first, first year here, and really uh, I want to thank uh, the whole team, again, Braxton Bragg chapter did an amazing job, uh, just uh, unbelievable pulling it together. And then also want to thank the uh, North Carolina Military Affairs Commission for their help and support and the Economic Development Partnership in North Carolina. They also did a, a tr tremendous job pulling together. And of course, Forcecom and the leadership. Great panels, appreciate your discussions, and then uh, it was really good to see the industry. We cannot do it without the best equipment to match the best soldiers in the world. And, and thankfully, we have 60 of those folks here uh, providing the best equipment. So thanks for joining us. I think, uh, again, I look forward to 10 to 12 October in Washington, D.C. is the big annual AUSA conference. If you have not been there, I'll tell you, do yourself a favor and, and show up. It, uh, it's a tremendous event, and, uh, and it's like this on steroids. Uh, you know, even uh, more exciting. So thanks for joining us, and have a great day. Ooh.